Well, welcome to anchor number three. We're glad you're here. We have people from many different states in the United States, and uh, we have two or three from foreign countries. We're glad that you're here, and we look forward to a great week of study together. Uh, the first thing that we want to do before we have our prayer is to review uh, our syllabus and take a look at what we are going to cover in this class. Not everything in the syllabus will be covered. It would be impossible within the time constraints that we have for this class to cover everything in the syllabus. The syllabus is uh, over 350 pages long, so there's no way that uh, we can do that in 22 sessions. Uh, however, there are certain parts of the syllabus that are non-negotiable. In other words, we're going to definitely cover those sections, and I'd like to uh, tell you up front which sections we are going to focus on. Uh, you'll notice uh, under number two in your uh, index where it says church and state in Revelation 13, the background of Daniel 2, that's what we're going to begin with this morning. And uh, then the next uh, one that we're going to study uh, the rest of the morning, and it might take us a little bit into the afternoon as well, is lessons from the Jewish harlot of Christ's day. That doesn't deal directly with Daniel and Revelation, although it gives us a lot of very important background into the prophecies of Revelation 12 and 13 that we're going to be taking a look at. A look at. Then we are going to go uh, to... Uh, study Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 through 10. This is the prophecy about the beast. And uh, so uh, this section uh, under number 4 comments on Revelation 13 verses 1 through 10. And then I will also take a few uh, details from number 1, notes on Revelation 13. So we'll study number 1 and number 4 together. Then the next thing that we're going to study is Revelation's land beast. This is the beast that comes from, up from the earth and has two horns like a lamb and ends up speaking like a dragon. Uh, we're going to dedicate a significant amount of time to study about the land beast. Uh, then after that we are going to take a look at the image of and to the beast, to the first beast. And that's going to take us a significant amount of time as well. I'm not sure whether we are going to be able to cover the number of the beast uh, because of time constraints. However, I have written a booklet on the number 666, which uh, is available, and also the content of the booklet is found in your syllabus. So I might make a few remarks about the number 666, but uh, you have the full presentation there in your syllabus. Uh, then uh, we're going to go to number 9. That's another non-negotiable, the mark of the beast. Uh, we're going to pursue this from several, several different perspectives, the mark of the beast. Uh, then we're going to go to page 207, which is changing the ordinance. Uh, that's a very, very important study on the change of uh, the day of rest from Sabbath to Sunday by the papacy. Uh, then uh, another non-negotiable is reflections on Daniel 11, page 239. Uh, that is a very important chapter for understanding uh, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Revelation 12, and 13. So uh, we are going to take a look at Daniel 11. Uh, and then we want to cover decoding the mysteries of Revelation 17. This is a, a very difficult chapter uh, when you isolate it from Revelation 12 and 13. But when you see Revelation 17 in the context of Revelation 12 and 13, uh, chapter 17 is not... Uh, as difficult as people sometimes make it. You know, some, some individuals make it very, very complicated. Uh, but it's not complicated when you look at it in the background of Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 13. Uh, there's one other thing that I want to mention. It's not in your syllabus. It's in the extra handout that you received. Uh, that is notes on Revelation 12. We are going to insert those notes on Revelation 12 uh, between number three and number four in your syllabus. So you might want to make a mark of that. Uh, we are going to insert the, the extra pages uh, in your syllabus. And uh, in the presentations, I will be mentioning uh, pages that are consecutive to the syllabus. In other words, those are extra pages, but I am going to speak as if they have already been inserted in your syllabus. Uh, because there will be people that will be watching uh, uh, these presentations, and uh, if I say we have extra pages, they're going to get confused. So those pages will be added to the number sequence 
in the syllabus when we get to that point. So uh, I wanted to make this clarification. We have a lot of material to study. I think it's going to be exciting. We are living in exciting times. We are living, I believe, at the last remnant of time. And these are the extremely significant prophecies that we need to understand for this time. So before we get into our first study, which is on page number five, we want to ask for the Lord's blessing as we study together. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before your throne today with joy in our hearts because we have not believed cunningly devised fables, because we have a clear picture of how the end time events will transpire and how the history of this world will come to an end with the glorious coming of Jesus Christ. We ask that you will bless us as we study these magnificent prophecies from your word. I ask that it will, will not only be an intellectual enterprise, but that it will speak to our minds and to our hearts and that it will make us more committed Christians, more committed Seventh-day Adventists. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the first prophecy that we're going to take a look at is Daniel chapter 2. We're not going to study the entire chapter because this uh, particular chapter is always preached in evangelistic meetings. I mean, I think we probably uh, know this prophecy better than any prophecy of Scripture. Uh, but we want to take a look especially at the feet of the image because this is going to set the tone for everything that we're going to study in this class. The feet of the image are the key and we're going to come back again and again and again to the teaching of the feet of the image. And so let's begin by going to Daniel chapter 2, verses 41 and 42. I'm going to follow the syllabus, um, not slavishly. I'll be adding thoughts here and there, but uh, pretty much I'm going to be following the order that we find in the syllabus. Now we're all uh, acquainted with the fact that Daniel chapter 2 has a great image, and the image is composed of metals. The head of gold, the breast and arms of silver, the belly of bronze, the legs of iron, and the feet of iron and clay. And how this portrays the flow of history from the days of Babylon uh, till the very end of time. Uh, but we want to take a special look at uh, the feet of the image. After Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, you have the feet. Let's read the two key verses that we're going to take a look at. Daniel chapter 2 and verses 41 and 42. Daniel 2, 41 and 42. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. So in the feet, you have a mixture of iron and clay. I want to make a few remarks about that. First of all, we want to notice that in this image, the metals devalue as, the, as you go down the image. Uh, basically, what this means is that history is going to degenerate. You know, history is not evolving to a golden age. It's not evolving to a new world order. History is deteriorating until when you get to the feet, you don't even have pure iron. You have a mixture of iron and clay. In other words, history is degenerating. History is not regenerating. History will end with a chaotic end. But the good news is that then Jesus will establish a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Another point that I want to emphasize is that each metal in the image of Daniel 2 represents a political power or a state. The gold represents the kingdom of Babylon. The silver, the kingdom of Medo-Persia. The bronze, the kingdom of Greece. And the iron represents the kingdom of Rome. In other words, each metal represents a state or a political power. But in the feet, you have something strange happening. You have clay which is added to the iron specifically. Something that is radically different than, than everything else in the image. 
because you're dealing with, from the head to the, to the legs, you're dealing with metals. And suddenly in the feet you have a strange element that doesn't seem to fit, because clay is not a metal. It's something different. It's something that really should not fit there. Now there's another important point, and that is that the iron in the feet existed before in the legs. That's a very important point. The iron in the feet existed before it was in the feet, it existed in the legs. Now what does the iron in the legs represent? The iron in the legs represents Rome. Don't we all agree on that? That the iron represents Rome? So let me ask you, does Rome, does the political power of Rome, because the iron represents the, the Rome as a state, does the political power of Rome continue in the foot stage of the image? Yes. Absolutely. Rome continues in the feet. However, it's a different kind of Rome. Because it is ironed mixed with what? With clay. So Rome continues, but it's an amalgamated Rome, if you please. It's a different kind of Rome. This must mean that the civil power of Rome will continue in the feet of the image with a new element added. And you will have an amalgamation of uh, two elements. One which is a metal, which is a state, and the other which is different and doesn't seem to fit. Now the clay that is mentioned in Daniel chapter 2 is not just any kind of clay. It is identified as potter's clay. In fact, it's interesting in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word that is used for clay is the word ostrakinon, where we get the word astraka from. Now archaeologists know that astraka are broken pot shirts. So basically this is talking about vessels that are, that are formed by a potter, vessels of clay. It's very important to understand that this is not any kind of clay, this is specifically potter's clay. Now the union of the iron and the clay is illegitimate. It is an abnormal union. The clay does not fit with the iron, the clay is out of place with the iron. They are two radically different elements. Now another important point is that Daniel 2 presents God's perspective of history. It does not present man's perspective of history. It presents God's perspective, how history will flow. So let me ask you, in the feet, is there unity? Yes, there is unity. From the perspective of whom? From the perspective of human beings, there is unity. But from the perspective of God, is there real unity in the feet? No. That's a very important point as we study this prophecy is that Daniel 2 has God's perspective of history. From the perspective of God, iron and clay should not go together. From the perspective of human beings, there is unity because the iron and the clay is united, but in the sight of God, it is an illegitimate union. Are you following me or not? That's a very important point as we study this. Now, the church and the state both have their legitimate place, don't they? Does the iron have a legitimate place? We're going to notice that it does. Does the clay have its legitimate place? Absolutely, both of them have their legitimate existence. However, they should not be together, they should be what? They should be separate, not together. Now, another important uh, point is that in Revelation 17, this union of iron and clay is illustrated with different symbolism. In Revelation chapter 17 we have a harlot woman. What does a woman represent in prophecy? A woman represents a church. And if it's an, a harlot woman, what kind of church does that represent? It represents a harlot church. Now what, uh, what made this woman a harlot? How did the church become a harlot? It says in Revelation chapter 17 that she fornicated with the kings of the earth. So is there, is there in Revelation 17 an illegitimate union? Yes, what is that illegitimate union in Revelation 17? It is a harlot church with fornicating with what? With the kings of the earth. We're going to find that that's the same thing as the mixture of the iron and the clay. Two different ways 
of saying the same thing. Are you following me or not? So in other words, uh, the, the harlot became a harlot because she linked up with the kings of the earth. Now let me ask you this. When a man marries a woman, they haven't been married before, is that a legitimate union? Is that union recognized in the sight of God? Absolutely. But let me ask you this, and I'm going to use the woman as an example because that's the, what the Bible presents. When the woman goes off and she links up with somebody who is not her husband, is there a union there? Is there union? Of course there's union. There's sexual union. But what kind of union is it in the sight of God? An illegitimate union. Are you following me? So men can join the two together, and uh, there's union in the sight of men, but in the sight of God, even though there's union, it is what? It is an illegitimate union. Are you following me? This is a very important point, because, you know, some people, misunder even in the Adventist church, misunderstand what Daniel chapter 2 is saying. There is union in Daniel chapter 2 of the iron and the clay, but not from the perspective of God from the perspective of man, because man is united to elements that God never wanted united. Now, another very important point is this. Daniel 2 does not tell us the whole story. Daniel 2 is like the skeleton of Bible prophecy. How important is the skeleton? <laughs> Everything else builds on the skeleton, right? If not, you're a jellyfish. The skeleton is vital. Because everything else builds on the skeleton. Daniel 2 does not give us the complete story, particularly the feet. If you read Daniel 2, you're going to come to the conclusion that the iron and the clay are mixed together until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because after the feet, there's nothing else. Are you following me? So, so if you just stick to Daniel chapter 2, you're going to say, well, there's a union of these two elements until the second coming of Jesus. But when you study prophecies beyond Daniel 2, parallel prophecies that add to the prophecy of Daniel 2, you're going to see, for example, in Daniel chapter 7, when we study the little horn, a little bit more information about this mixture of iron and clay. You're going to see that the iron and the clay were, were mixed for 1260 years. But even Daniel 7 doesn't give you the complete picture. Because when you go to Revelation 13, you're going to find that the beast ruled for 1260 years, and then it received a deadly wound. There was a period when church and, and state were separated from one another, but then the deadly wound is healed, and the iron and the clay are mixed together once again. Are you with me or not? So Daniel 2 doesn't tell you that there's a period between the first period of existence of the papacy and the second period of existence. It gives you the global picture that there's going to be a union of church and state until Jesus comes. But it doesn't tell you that between uh, the two stages of the papacy, there's going to be a period where church and state are going to be separated. Are you following me or not? Now, th this is a common thing in Bible prophecy. For example, in Daniel chapter 7, uh, you have a leopard beast. It says that the leopard has four heads, right? Now, uh, it doesn't say that the leopard, you know, existed for a while and then the leopard uh, grew four heads. No, it said there's a leopard and it has four heads. Because in Daniel 7, the leopard is giving you the total history of the leopard. But, but when you go to chapter 8, there it tells you, under different symbolism, that there is a he-goat, and the he-goat has a notable horn, which is Alexander the Great. The notable horn is broken, and then four horns come out. So if you read only Daniel 7, you'll say, oh, you know, this leopard beast had the, the four heads or the four divisions from the get-go. But you have to go to additional prophecies. Are you understanding me? You have to go to additional prophecies to catch the complete picture of what God is trying to tell you, what God is trying to teach you about these things. So... The feet of the image take you, folks, from the time that church and state were, jo were joined together all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ. It gives you the total picture, but it does not give you all of the details within that picture. Are you with me so far? 
Very important point. We, the prophecy builds. In other words, if you want to understand Daniel 2, you've got to go to Revelation 12. You've got to go to Revelation 13. You've got to go to Revelation 17. You've got to go to Daniel chapter 11. And once you put all of the prophecies together, then you say, ah, now I have the complete picture. Daniel 2 is the outline. What is an outline? Does an outline give you the total picture? No. no. It gives you the main points. And then afterwards, in the text, you find, see, we have, for example, the, the table of contents of the syllabus. Uh, that tells you where we're going. But when you go to the syllabus, then you have the total and complete picture. Now, another point that we need to understand is that in Daniel chapter 2, it says that, that the union of the clay and the iron will be partly strong and partly weak. Now the question is, what is strong and what is weak? Is the iron strong and the clay weak, or is it vice versa? We don't have to guess. Let's go, I want to go first of all to a statement from Ellen White. This is, uh, uh, if you're following along, it is uh, in your syllabus. Ellen White uh, makes this comment about what is strong. Mount of Blessings, page 126. MB is Mount of Blessings, page 126. She's speaking about the papacy, and she says, Finding herself destitute of the power of love, she has reached out for the what? Oh, there's the key word, for the what? The strong arm of the state. So which part of this union is strong? It's the state part, right? So once again, finding herself destitute of the power of love, she has reached out for the strong arm of the state to enforce her dogmas and execute her decrees. Here is the secret of all religious laws that have ever been enacted and the secret of all persecution from the days of Abel to our own time. So what, what is the secret to uh, persecution throughout the whole history of the world? The union of church and state. That's why we're studying this first, the mixture of the iron and the clay. We don't have to depend on Ellen White. I'm thankful for her. And uh, she, I find her to be in harmony with Scripture. And uh, what she says is simply amazing. But uh, the Bible itself tells us that it is the iron that is strong. Notice uh, what we find in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. And then what does it say? exceedingly strong. So what is the strong part in the feet? It's the civil power of Rome. In other words, it's the state part that is strong. So it says exceeding strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Interestingly, also, Ellen White, in Great Controversy, page 581, uh, speaks of the Roman element when she describes the papacy. Interesting that she would call it the Roman element. Do you know what the Roman element is? It is the state, the church being able to use the state. Are you following me or not? Now, notice what, what she says in Great Controversy, 581. This is in your syllabus. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Speaking about the papacy. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. The Roman element, folks, is the, the church becoming allied with the state, with the civil power to enforce her dogmas and her practices. Now, uh, in Daniel chapter 2, everything is symbolic, right? Is the gold a symbol? Is the silver a symbol? Is the brass a symbol? Is the iron a symbol? Is the stone that hits the image a symbol? Is the great mountain that the stone grows into a symbol? So must the clay also be symbolic? See, many times we're in inconsistent in our way of interpreting prophecy. You know, we say everything in Daniel 2 is symbolic, but, you know, the clay, we kind of, you know, sweep it under the rug and we don't see what the clay really represents from the perspective of Ellen White and from the perspective of Scripture. 
there's more to the feat than just the, you know, uh, the Roman Empire being divided into ten political kingdoms. That is illustrated by the ten toes. The ten toes, you know, the iron, the ten toes represent that the Roman Empire was divided into ten kingdoms, but then the clay is added. Does the iron exist before the clay? So in the feet, must the clay be added to the iron? Absolutely. Uh, are you following me? Now, let's notice uh, a statement, a very si significant statement from Ellen White about the mixture of the iron and the clay. Uh, this is found in uh, Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1168. She says, We have come to a time when God's sacred work is represented by the feet of the image in which the iron was mixed with the miry clay. God has a people, a chosen people, whose discernment must be sanctified, who must not become unholy by laying upon the foundation wood, hay, and stubble. Every soul who is loyal to the commandments of God will see that the distinguishing feature of our faith is the seventh-day Sabbath. If the government would honor the Sabbath as God has commanded. Now when she says if the government would honor the Sabbath, she's not saying that the government should make laws honoring the Sabbath. She's saying that the government should, should allow people to practice the observance of the Sabbath. So uh, once again, she says, if the government would honor the Sabbath as God has commanded, it would stand in the strength of God and in defense of the faith once delivered to the saints. But statesmen... Who are the statesmen? Politicians, right? But the statesmen will uphold the spurious Sabbath and will mingle. Interesting. Mingle. Remember Daniel 2? Will mingle their religious faith with the observance of this child, this child of the papacy, placing it above the Sabbath which the Lord has sanctified and blessed, setting it apart for man to keep holy as a sign between him and his people to a thousand generations. And now listen carefully. The iron and the clay represent the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft. Is that clear enough? Well, in case it's not clear enough, let's continue reading. This union, so is there union? Is there union? Uh, but the, but it, says, it says in Daniel 2 that they will not be united. Whose perspective in Daniel 2? God's perspective. From man's perspective, is there union? Is there going to be? Revelation 17 says that the ten kings, which represent the kings of the earth and the whole world, will be of one mind. The end time application of, of, of the feet of Daniel, the, the ten toes will unite. They will be of one mind. But it's not unity in the sight of God. So it continues saying here, uh, the iron and the clay represent the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft. This union is weakening all the power of the churches. This investing of the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. Men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance. They have invested their strength in what? In politics. And have united with the papacy. Speaking about the statesmen. But the time will come when God will punish those who have made void His law. And their evil work will recoil upon themselves. So is Ellen White clear on what is represented by the, by the make, mingling or mixing of uh, iron and clay? Absolutely. It represents the union of church and state. And you might say, but Pastor Bohr, uh, does the Bible teach such a thing? Yes, it does. But we have, to, we have to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. You know, it's become very common in the Adventist church these days for some of our theologians to create a new way of interpreting the Bible. They say, you know, what we need to do, we can't take one verse here, another verse here, and another one over here to explain this certain verse. You know, you have to take each verse within itself and study it by itself. By the way, this is the historical critical method of studying Scripture. But the Adventist method and the Protestant method is that you allow Scripture to be its own interpreter. In other words, you allow different texts to explain what the clay represents. You let the Bible in all different places explain 
what the clay represents. You don't just stay with the clay in Daniel 2 because if you do, you would never understand what the clay represents. Who superintended the composition of Scripture? The Holy Spirit. Do you think the Holy Spirit put everything in the Bible that we need to understand the Bible? Of course. We don't need the theologians to tell us what the Bible means. It's not bad to have theologians. But what I'm saying is that the Bible explains itself. The Bible interprets itself by comparing one text with another text and another text. Of course, when we, when we link all of these texts, they must be dealing with the same theme. I mean, it doesn't mean that you can connect texts that have no connection whatsoever. Now, let's see what the Bible has to say about the clay. We know what the iron represent, represents. It represents the political power of Rome. It represents the state, because that's what the iron represents in the legs. But now let's take a little tour of Scripture to see if Scripture corroborates what Ellen White has to say about the clay representing the church. And we're going to begin by taking a look at Jeremiah chapter 18 and verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah 18 verses 1 through 6. Now uh, it says there, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the... Mm. Does that instantly say, now wait a minute, where did we find potters before? In Daniel 2, right? Go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of... Oh, there's another key word in Daniel chapter 2. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. So here you have a potter who's taking clay and he's forming a vessel out of the potter's clay. Now, uh, what happens with this vessel? The vessel is broken in the hands of the potter. Now we need to understand this within its historical context. Jeremiah is writing right before the Babylonian captivity. The breaking of the vessel represents the captivity of Israel. They were broken up, they were sent into captivity. The remaking of the vessel represents Israel returning from the captivity and being restored again. Are you following me? within its historical context. And so the clay, the vessel of clay represents Israel. And you say, how do you know that? Because the text says so. Let's go uh, to the end of this passage. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? So what does the potter's clay represent? It represents Israel. That's right. Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So what does the potter's clay represent? It represents Israel. Was Israel God's people in the Old Testament? Was Israel God's church? In fact, if you want to add this to your notes, Acts 7 verse 38 refers to Israel in the wilderness as God's ecclesia. The Greek word is ecclesia. Do you know what word we get from ecclesia? In Spanish, that's iglesia. Church. It's the church in the wilderness. And by the way, Isaiah constantly refers to God forming Israel. It's the Hebrew word yatsar which means a potter forming Israel. Uh, for example, in Isaiah 43, verse 1 and verse 21, uh, God says, I have formed you, O Jacob. So, so God forms His people like a potter what? Like a potter forms a vessel out of clay. Now, something I added that you want to put in your syllabus, Romans 9, verses 20 and 21. Romans 9, 20 and 21. If you read these verses, you'll discover that the Apostle Paul is saying that the body of man is fragile. And it's fragile because it's made out of clay. Remember, the body of man is fragile because it is made 
out of clay. Now we're going to see, uh, and we've already seen from the writings of Ellen White, but we're going to see from Scripture that uh, the body of clay, which the Apostle Paul describes as fragile, is, uh, because it's fragile, it feels like it needs to ally itself with something that is strong. The church is the body of Christ, right? So if the church is the body of Christ, the church appears to be what in the world? It appears to be weak. So what does the church uh, do because it appears to be weak? It says, we need, to, we need to ally ourselves with the strong element, which is what? Which is the, which is the state, that's right. They think that they need to unite with the state to uh, make the church survive in a tumultuous world. But what the church fails to realize is that it must be united with Christ, and when it's united with Christ, it is strong, not with the civil powers of the world. So what I want you to remember at this point uh, in Romans 9, 20 and 21, the body of man is fragile. And we're going to see that the reason why in Daniel 2 the clay and the iron are joined together by human beings is because they, they say, well, the church is fragile, and so the church needs the help of the state in order to survive, in order to subsist. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Uh, this is speaking about the literal creation of Adam. When God created the physical body of man, he made it out of what? Out of potter's clay. You say, now wait a minute. Let's read Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 7. And the Lord God, what? That's a key word. Remember it's a key word in, in, Isaiah, in the book of uh, Jeremiah? Formed. So it says, the Lord God formed. What did he form? Man. What part of man? The physical body, right? The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. You say, that doesn't say clay, it says dust of the ground. Yeah, but in Jeremiah, or in Isaiah 64, verse 8, which you have right below that, it says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are potter. Nobody can make anything out of dust. It was wet dust. In other words, it was potter's clay according to Isaiah 64 and verse 8. So what was the body of man formed out of? It was formed out of potter's clay. And God formed, it says, God formed man of the dust of the ground. And so when he formed the body of man, the body of man was lifeless, right? So what was lacking in order for the body to function? It needed to have the breath of life or the spirit of life placed within it. And so we find in the second part of uh, Genesis 2, verse 7, it says, And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a what? Man became a living being. Now, when the, when the body that God formed out of clay was filled with the spirit of life, did all of the parts of the body begin fulfilling their function? Did the eye start seeing? Did the stomach start digesting once they started eating? Of course. Did the ear start hearing? Did the heart start, start beating? Did the lungs start breathing? Yes. Every member of the body started fulfilling its function when the body of clay was united with the spirit of life. We're speaking literally now. See? Literal body, literal spirit, Literal body parts literally fulfilling their function. But is Daniel chapter 2 speaking literally? Is the clay literal? No. Now let me ask you this. Spiritually speaking, because we're dealing with symbols in Daniel chapter 2. Spiritually speaking, what is the body of Christ? Who formed it? Who formed, who formed the body of Christ? Well, it's the body of Christ. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. So, is the church the body of Christ? Yes. It most certainly is. Let's read it. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. 
and He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. So the church, spiritually speaking, is the body of Christ, and it was formed by Christ. Now, what happened when Jesus formed His body before it received the breath of life? Or rather, expressed in a different way, when did the body of Christ receive the spirit of life, spiritually speaking? When God, when God created the body of Adam, before He put in the breath, was the, uh, was the body complete? Did the body have all of its different organs and systems and everything? Yes, it was complete, but it was lifeless. When did it become alive? When the spirit of life was put in, right? Now, on the day of Pentecost, in what condition was the church? It was, they were all of one accord. They were a united body. Are you following me or not? But the body was lifeless. What was still lacking? What was still lacking was that the Spirit would come into the church to give the church life so that each body part could begin fulfilling its function. When did that happen? When did the united body... By the way, Jesus had prayed... In John 17, that he would make his disciples what? One. Did they become one on the day of Pentecost? They were all of one accord. But what was lacking? The spirit of life. What did God do on the day of Pentecost? He put in that body the spirit of life. Did every member of the church begin fulfilling his function or her function at that moment? Let's notice by the way, I did not create this, uh, this illustration, and this illustration is provided by the Apostle Paul. Uh, let's read, first of all, Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, like the body had all of its parts when God created it. Then the Spirit comes in. Notice Acts 2, verses 2 through 4. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. See, there's the breath of life coming into the church. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So uh, do, do uh, they begin speaking in tongues? Do they receive a gift of the Holy Spirit that they now need to put into function? Absolutely. The Apostle Paul, by the way, was the one who, um, who amplified this concept that I'm sharing with you, that the church spiritually is the body, and uh, the, the church receives the spirit, and then every body uh, part begins fulfilling its function. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 13. Here the Apostle Paul says, But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. For as the body is one, and as many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Are you seeing the parallel? So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we have, we have literal clay. Jesus creates a literal body puts literal breath into the body. And when he does that, the body begins fulfilling its functions. But spiritually speaking, the church is composed of spiritual clay, so to speak. It has all of the parts together, but when the spirit comes in, each member of the body begins fulfilling its what? Its function. So what does the clay represent? The, the clay represents the church. 
Let's go also to Ezekiel 37 verses 10 and 11. Have you ever heard of the valley of dry bones? <laughs> you know all these bones are strewn all over a valley, dead, but then the body is formed, it all comes together, all the body parts come together. And then what happens when all the body parts come together? Oh, uh, the, the wind is called to enter the, 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 the dry bones, and now the body lives. What does that represent? We don't have to guess. Ezekiel 37, 10 and 11 tells us, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them. Notice, breath came into them. And they lived, and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. And now it comes the explanation of what this means. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. So what does the body represent? The body represents Israel. And Israel is God's what? Is God's church. And what is the body composed of spiritually? Clay. Just like the physical body is composed of what? Of clay. And so it says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, because this is the captivity that is being referred to, and we ourselves are cut off. But God promises after the captivity that He's going to bring them together, and He's going to give them His Spirit again. It's similar to Jeremiah. You know, the vessel, the potter's vessel is broken in the hands of the potter, but then God makes it another vessel. So clearly... Ellen White is right when she says that the clay represents, spiritually speaking, what? God's body or God's church. So what happens in the feet of the image? What happens in the last stage of human history? There is going to be a union of what? Of the strong arm of the state, the Roman element, and the church. Why will the church ally itself with the state? Because it's fragile. And it says, if we don't do this, the church is going to cease to exist. So we need the help of what? Of the state. Has that been the case all throughout history with God's people? They feel like they have to ally themselves with the stronger uh, political leaders, with the pagans, in order for the church to survive. That's been the history. And so that's the scenario that we have. Now let's go to our last point here, Revelation 17, verses 1 and 2, presents the same idea with different symbols. In Revelation chapter 17, we no longer have iron and clay. Incidentally, Revelation 17 is talking about the final union of the iron with the clay. What scenario do we have there in Revelation chapter 17? Well, let's read verses 1 and 2. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot, prostitute woman, who sits on many waters. And how did she become a prostitute? How did she become a harlot? Verse 2 explains it. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. So how did the church become a harlot? By linking up with what? With the kings of the earth. Is that the same as the iron and the clay being blended together? Absolutely. So It's a different symbolism, but it represents the same truth. And it continues saying, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And then chapter 18 uh, adds to this scenario by saying in verses 1 through 3, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. This is what is known as the loud cry. It's the last call of God's people to come out of this confusing system, out of Babylon. And uh, unfortunately, this message is not being proclaimed right now. But Ellen White says that it when it will be, the whole Christian world will be, will be shaken up. And, and hundreds and thousands will leave Babylon and will join God's people. 
because they will see that they belong to religious systems that have linked together uh, the, the political systems of the world with the church. Religion with politics. Notice verse 2, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons. Wow, that's quite a statement, isn't it? A prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. In Scripture, birds, uh, birds represent uh, Satan. Remember in the parable of the sower that uh, it says that some of the seeds fell along the road and the birds came and took them up. Then Jesus explains that the taking up of the seeds by the birds represents Satan takes away the seed from the heart. So it's the, we let the Bible explain itself. These are not talking about literal birds. Papacy doesn't have, doesn't have a, a, a bird cage, literally speaking. It continues saying there, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and what? And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. So once again, the loud cry is calling people out of a religious system that joined the church with the state. And in this way, the church became a what? The church became a harlot. So uh, are you understanding what Daniel chapter 2 is teaching us in the feet of the image? Basically, we have the whole history of the world from the days of Babylon, from the days of Daniel, till the end of time. You have, first of all, the head of gold, Babylon. Breast and arms of silver, Medo-Persia. Belly of bronze, Greece. Legs of iron, only one element, the Roman Empire. Then you have the ten toes, which means that the Roman Empire is divided. You have iron in the feet, Rome continues, but it's a different Rome. Because it's a Rome that joins the church, which is the clay, with the iron, which represents the state. But as I was mentioning before, what uh, Daniel chapter 2 does not mention is that the, the period of the feet is more complex than just iron and clay mixed together and then until Jesus comes. When you go to Daniel chapter 7, you find that the clay is the little horn. And the little horn rules for 1260 years. And what the little horn does is all religious. It speaks blasphemies against the Most High. It persecutes the saints of the Most High. It thinks it can change God's law. Are those all religious activities? Absolutely. In other words, in Daniel chapter 7, we know how long the iron and the clay are going to exist together. But when you finish Daniel 7, you don't, you don't have the complete story. Because, okay, 1260 years... Uh, and uh, this union comes to an end. No. You have to go to Revelation 13, verses 1 to 10. In Revelation 13, verses 1, to, 1 through 10, uh, it tells us that this beast power, which is the same as a little horn, rules for 42 months, which is the same as time, times, and the dividing of time, 1260 years. Are you with me? But what we're told in Revelation 13 that is not in Daniel 7 and is not in Daniel chapter 2, at least it's not explicitly in Daniel 7, it's implicit because uh, uh, Daniel chapter 7 says that when Jesus comes, he's going to destroy the little horn, so the little horn must be ruling. But it's implicit, it's not explicit. But when you get to Revelation chapter 13, what is implicit in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 now becomes explicit. And that is that uh, when the Lord Jesus comes, there is going to be this union of church and state because the stone hits what? Hits the feet of the image. And the feet have iron and clay. Is there going to be a mixture of iron and clay at the very end of time? Yes. Revelation 13 tells us that after ruling for 42 months, this beast power received a what? A deadly wound and was thrown into captivity. Is that in Daniel 7? Is that detail in Daniel 7? No. Is it in Daniel 2? No. So what happens if you, if you take the counsel of, of many of these theologians? Well, you have to study each text within itself. 
you're stumped. You have to allow all of the scenario of Scripture to explain a concept. And so in Revelation chapter 13, we find that it says that this beast, after it rules 42 months, it receives a deadly wound with a sword. We're a study about the sword and the deadly wound. And it goes into captivity. By the way, there's more than just uh, Pope Pius VI being taken captive to France. It's not a singular pope that fulfills this prophecy. It is the entire system that fulfills this prophecy. Because it says the beast is taken into captivity, not a particular pope. Now, uh, it's significant that, that a particular pope was taken because that means that the whole system is sent into captivity. But it's the system that is sent into captivity, and we need to understand what the captivity is and what the, the wound with the sword is. It's much deeper, much more profound than, than what we've generally assumed. And so what does Revelation 13 say? It tells us that after the, this beast receives a deadly wound, there's a period where church and state are what? Separated. But then Revelation 13 verse 3 tells us that its deadly wound is healed. So is it going to have another stage where church and state are going to be joined together? Absolutely. So it says, its deadly wound was healed, and the whole world worshipped and marveled after the beast. So when you study Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and Revelation 13, 1 through 10, you now have the complete picture. And by the way, when you get to Revelation chapter 17, there you have the fully and complete picture. Because Revelation 17, folks, is simply describing the time when the deadly wound is healed. Revelation 17 is an exposition of the phrase, its deadly wound was healed, and the whole world marveled after the beast. Because the harlot is seated on the waters, and the waters represent multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. She's sitting as queen again over the whole world. And of course, there you have a description of the final judgment that will be given also against this system, which is the same as the stone hitting the feet of the image and Jesus establishing a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So Daniel and Revelation must be studied together. We must interpret symbols in the light of their use in the totality of Scripture. We can't remain just in one text or one passage and think that we're going to get the full, full picture from there. We must allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary-level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.